um, I kind of call this like my court survival guide. And the number one thing that people have to understand about court is court is 100 percent about evidence. OK, you hear a lot of people on the Internet. They always oh, the court is corrupt. The court is corrupt. This is corrupt. This is corrupt. But it's corrupt to a person who is ignorant to how, how it functions. So the key to understanding court is to always go through your rules of civil procedure, because in a criminal court case, it's all civil. They have to sue you to get you into court. And from there, once they sue you, uh, that's what stops the court case, because then they don't have you can stop anything from becoming criminal by challenging the competency of the court, competency of the individuals uh, who provide testimony competency, uh, the competent authority of the court to, to enforce or impose anything, whether it's sanctions, which most court cases are sanctions, uh, using statutory law, or anything. So uh, the reason why most people lose in court because they don't challenge the competency. So you have to challenge the competency of the court. So a court of competent jurisdiction means uh, appropriate uh, court for that type of action. Uh, when used to refer uh, to inspection of original certificate of birth upon adaptation. A court of competent jurisdiction means the court which ab the adaptation was ordered. So what is competency? What is competent jurisdiction? Why is it so important? So I'm going to get all this boring stuff out and then we, <laughs> so, you, so we can kind of get to the meat of everything. So pretty much when a court has general jurisdiction, that means that they have the ability to have a competent authority to hear a case. But just as anything, it appears on its face to do that, but it's not. Because if you go into court and you challenge the competency, then that's where everything starts to change. Because a lot of times you can either accept the charges, which I, I usually advise because you don't want to get into this Perry Mason legal battle until you actually know how to battle in court. Uh, and then once you understand how to battle in court, you don't have to accept nothing. You know what I'm saying? That's just a choice of yours. You can just go into court if it's a little traffic ticket and you don't think it's worth your time. Uh, then I would just go ahead and just accept it and endorse it to the Treasury and, and settle the settle the uh, pending charges. Um, but, yeah, the court of competent jurisdiction means a court of general jurisdiction in the county in which a lawyer maintains or has maintained principal office. There's multiple meanings of this. But I was looking for the best meaning of competency, uh, and it's usually on Britannica. Uh, let me see if I can get that. Uh, and this, uh, we went over this in my first law class, so I know, Nancy, I apologize <laughs> uh, if you got to hear this again. Uh, but a lot of people don't bring up competency. And I remember I had a, uh, I had a class with somebody, uh, and we did a, we did a, um, a consultation. And they, they were like, I ain't never heard that in my life. I never heard anybody talk about competency versus jurisdiction. In law, the authority of a court to deal with specific matters, competency, competency refers to the legal ability of the court to exert jurisdiction over a person or a thing, property, that is subject to the subject of the suit. So like when people go to court, like think if it's a car loan, right? What they what people do is they allow the note into the court as evidence when they should in, they should instantly object to that note being provided into the court. Now, the reason why they need to object to that note being provided into the court, whether it's mortgage, car loan, criminal, you need to object to the traffic ticket. You need to object to the complaint because you have to make the court prove this is where the judge comes in or this is where the prosecutor comes in to prove that the court has the authority to mitigate property that's under of a live person, which the hell they don't, okay? If you've never elected anybody, if there's no written proof in the evidence of the court, I don't care about this assumption that the court has power of attorney because your birth certificate, that's an assumption, okay? If there is nothing in front of the court, the court can only see what is in front of it. That's why justice is blind. That's why the justice is blindfolded. OK, and that's why she's holding an uneven scale, because really the court is about accounting. OK, that's why you see the IRS. When you see the IRS symbol, the IRS symbol is a balanced scale because the IRS balanced the books. So competency 
Let's see. So that's a legal, uh, uh, personal thing, property subject to the suit. Jurisdiction, that which a competent court may exert. So you have to challenge the court's competency prior to challenging their jurisdiction. People don't know this. But in every state, there should be a competency doctrine. Learn it. Get it. See if somebody can provide it to you. Call the clerk of your courts and ask if she has a copy of it or if she can find somebody that can provide a copy of it. The more you learn your state's law, the stronger you are. So then all you have to do is learn your state's law and then you can copy paste it and do it in anybody's state. So think about it. If you're going on vacation and people think that they can't get arrested, you know, oh, I can't get arrested. Like say if I'm going to Florida, I already know Florida law. So I know I ain't going to jail. But an average person goes to Florida. They don't know Florida law. They may know Wisconsin law. They may know New York law. Go down to Florida. And as they say, go down on vacation, end up on probation in Florida. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, you, you want to learn your state's law and then copy paste it. So like if you're going on vacation, you already know how to fight stuff. And not only to mention that, if you go on vacation, you might be able to go to a court and be able to save a foreclosure and, and make money while you're on vacation. So there's so many options when you know the law. You might just go down to the court and, and, and find a, the courtroom steps and be able to save a foreclosure and get that money. So once you know law, I mean, shoot, you can sit there and help people at the court beat their traffic tickets for money on vacation. If you want to have fun with it and have them give you limited power of attorney. OK, so jurisdiction also may be defined as authority conferred upon a court, thus making it competent to hear and determine cases and causes. Jurisdiction authority is constitutionally determined. So you have to read your state's constitution. The key is to know your state's constitution because you'll understand the structure of the courts. You'll understand that your county court is really a United States court. It's not an actual state court. Yeah, so you have to read the Buck Act. You have to read the Trading with the Enemy Act. These are acts you have to read because you'll understand the structure of your county. Your county is a United States court. So if they're dealing with you, they don't have the authority to deal with you until you go in and consent. That's why the court must have what's the next thing we're going to go over. All right. So the court must have personal jurisdiction. Now, how does the court obtain personal jurisdiction is the key thing. So the court obtains personal jurisdiction by evidence, okay? Evidence of a contract, evidence of documents, evidence of indebtedness. This is why once you understand court, you will understand how to stop a court case. Because once you start challenging the evidence, you will notice that most court cases will fall apart they'll fall on their face. So you have to challenge the personal jurisdiction, okay? The overview of personal jurisdiction refers to the power of the court to make decisions regarding the party being sued in this case, in a case. Before a court can exercise power, listen to what I'm saying. So this is for child support. This is for everything. Over the party, they have to have, they have to have personal jurisdiction. So you always challenge a court's personal jurisdiction. If you're going into court, if you want to challenge it, you know, now, if you want to accept it, we'll get into acceptance. I'll get into all of that during this call and then we'll get into more of the meat stuff. OK, so a court can exercise its power over the party. OK, the, the U.S. Constitution requires that a party uh, has certain minimum contacts with the form in which the court sits. And this is international shoe versus Washington. OK, so this is a big case. You want to read it because it has to do with notice. OK, and it has to do with non-residents. It doesn't have to do with residents of a state. It has to do with non-resident. OK, so so if if the plaintiff sues the defendant, the defendant can what object to the suit by arguing that the court does not have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. So. The key ways that a court can obtain personal jurisdiction over the defendant is them waiving personal jurisdiction or them appearing, which can be which can be seen as a waiving of personal jurisdiction. But you can also walk that back if you appeared in the case too, saying that you didn't know that you were waiving jurisdiction. So 
you save yourself. You save yourself by uh, stopping that because otherwise they'll take it on the record as even though it's not really a court of record, they'll take it that you waived your personal jurisdiction. Waiving personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction can be generally be waived uh, contrast with subject matter jurisdiction. You can't waive subject matter jurisdiction. For subject matter jurisdiction up here, we'll, we'll talk about subject matter jurisdiction also, which cannot be waived. So if the party being sued appears in court without what? Objecting to the court's lack of personal jurisdiction over it. This is 100% what people do not do in child support. So they never object to it. They come into court. They never object to traffic court because there's nowhere in the Constitution that allows a traffic court to obtain any jurisdiction um, or any court that maintains traffic because traffic is what? A federal crime. So when you're going into court, you're appearing and then you give them you're giving them what is called an implied contract. So without obtaining the court's lack of, I'm sorry, without objecting to the court's lack of personal jurisdiction over it, then the court will what? Assume that the defendant is waiving any challenge to personal jurisdiction. So what you have to do is put it on the record that you are challenging and that you are retaining uh, your rights to object to personal jurisdiction if you're going in the court. Make sure if you're putting that, make sure that that is featured on your motion and that you read it into the record. So if you appear, let the court say, let the let the court know that you are first, you're going to you're going to proffer the record. So proffering the record is just putting something on a record. So the court cannot proceed uh, without it, because when you look at if you go to any court case and you look at the record, it will never say what was stated 100 percent what was stated at court. So, because most people don't know that you have to request that what you're saying is put on the record. Okay, so object obtaining personal jurisdiction. Typically for a court to have personal jurisdiction over defendant, the plaintiff needs to what? Serve the defendant, okay? So if you're in a traffic case, you're in a criminal case, and you have not received service, that court has no personal jurisdiction over you, even if you appear. So you have to tell the court that if the, even if my appearance may seem as a waiving of a, of a personal jurisdiction, but the the plaintiff failed to provide a, a, send, send a complaint to me. So if the plaintiff doesn't send a complaint to you or they don't have evidence of a return receipt, uh, then they fail to provide proper service. So then you could make them either drop the case or go through and and uh correct their 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 issue okay in in the state in which the court sits a defendant needs to what voluntarily appear in court so in child support do they make you voluntarily appear in court hell no nah. they'll basically say if you don't appear we're gonna put you on child support just like if they tell you if you don't appear for a traffic if you don't appear we're gonna send you to jail that's a threat so if they send you anything like that in a mail, make sure you take that and use that in your case against them, against the court or against the municipality or the county that is doing this, because that's your case to prove that they're extorting you and doing RICO and racketeering on you. So you always want to make sure that you're 10 steps ahead of them. So whatever they send you stuff threatening you, if you don't appear in court, you may go to jail. That's a threat. I take it as a threat. So. We have to go to the big boy right here or big girl, whatever you want to call it, which is subject matter. OK, subject matter uh, usually is obtained by the definition is here. The power of a court to adjudicate a particular type of matter and to provide the remedy demanded. So if you go in the court and you say, OK, your honor, I accept all these charges and I agree to take the payment. And then the prosecutor says, no, you can't do that. Well, then the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction. You see what I'm saying? That's why I always tell people to offer payment. So you don't have to pay them by money because Article 1, Section 10 is clear, the Constitution, that they cannot demand money out of you. They can't demand anything beside gold or silver. So since they don't set up the process that every case should be dismissed for one of the reasons I'm going to show you today. So an overview, a court must have jurisdiction to enter a valid also this works too for attorneys and people appearing in court 
if they don't have the authority to settle, then they don't have a case. So, like, if an attorney appears and you say, okay, I'll give you a check today. Uh, do you have the ability to drop this case? Or I'll give you a void check. And um, I'll, I'll give you a void check and I'll endorse your, your uh, case for payment. Will you, will you, do you have a right to process this and drop the case and give me my car back or give me my house back? If the attorney says that, I say, I'll say, Your Honor, for the record, uh, I spoke to attorney John Smith, John Smith uh, in, in the gallo before we got into the to the to the court. And we spoke about settlement. Uh, John Smith doesn't have settlement authority. So the court, as of now, does not lack subject matter jurisdiction. You see what I'm saying? And I'm going to petition the court to move and dismiss this case because he is bringing a claim on behalf of the bank. But he is, does not have the authority or she does not have the authority for settlement. So they need to either bring a person for settlement here. And I'm doing this in good faith to not waste the court's time. Yeah, I'll settle. I'll settle with them. I'll, but they don't have the authority to do it. So they need to bring somebody who has settlement authority. OK. A court may must have jurisdiction to enter a valid enforceable judgment on a claim where jurisdiction is lacking litigants through various procedural me mechanisms may retroactively challenge the validity of the judgment now if you remember i have a case uh, uh, i have a, a video talking about collateral attacks so a collateral attack can happen like say if the court goes forth they just maim you do your rights wrong and then they just enter a judgment. You can collaterally attack that in any court, whether it's state or federal. So most people don't know that. You can attack anything. That's why I tell people, if you got a court case, don't panic. I mean, let them do you wrong and just take all that evidence against them. And then you send them a bill. Jurisdiction may be broken down into two categories, personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, personal jurisdiction is, uh, is a re the requirement that a given court have power over the defendant based on minimum contacts with the form. Now, wh where these minimum contacts come from is prima facie evidence. So whenever they deposit something in the court pursuant to Rule 67, this is what forms the minimum contact, okay? It, that's what forms it because there's a contract, there's evidence of indebtedness within the state, and then they deposit it in the court. So if you understand what I'm saying, the court is really a bank. You know, they're depositing something in the bank and they're using the court as a collection agent. If you ever had a house or a, a car loan, you notice that your car loan, your house can be assigned to a debt collector. Well, that's what the court is acting as. And that's why most people lose their foreclosure cases, child support cases, because they don't understand there's two debts that have been created. There's one that's been created with the child support agency, and then there's one that's been created with the court. So you're fighting two debts. So you have to settle both of them you know, for the court to not have what is called a controversy. And we'll get into that too. So um, let's see, minimum context rule. Subject matter jurisdiction is a requirement that a given court have power to hear the specific claim that is brought to the court. While litigants, I'm sorry, while litigating parties may waive personal jurisdiction, they cannot waive subject matter jurisdiction in federal court under federal rules of civil procedure. You always wanna learn your federal rules of civil procedure. Let me tell you why. There's only like, I think it's like 80 federal rules of civil procedure. But when you go into your your courts, they have rules all over the place. But you want to keep it straight to the federal rules of civil procedure. Because when you're studying this, that is going to be your base. So then once you go into your uh, state, once you go on like Lex Law, and I think it's 83 rules or something like that. Um, once you start studying that, then you punch it into your state. So then you just copy paste rule 16, rule 17 in your state. Um, and then you'll just keep going on from down there. And then you'll start building a template. That's how I started studying law. And that's how I got it quicker than most people. Because I took the federal rules of civil procedure. And then I expanded off the federal rules of civil procedure to look up all my state laws. So let's see. A motion to dismiss for subject matter jurisdiction. Okay, a motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction is considered a favorite defense and may be raised at any point in the litigation process. So you hear some of these people on the internet saying, don't file a motion, don't file a motion. You could file an affidavit, they're gonna take it as a motion. Um, they could take it however they want to. So 
you can file a motion with the court. That doesn't give them jurisdiction, especially if I'm filing a motion challenging their jurisdiction. That definitely doesn't give them jurisdiction. Even if the parties had previous argued that subject matter jurisdiction existed, in fact, the court may dismiss the case sua sponte, meaning at its own volition, for the lack of subject matter jurisdiction. So see uh, Federal Civil Procedure 